This is an opportunity uh, tonight, I think that's super special. Uh, you're going to get a chance to actually uh, not only hear a, a presentation, but see a presentation of how uh, pottery is put together and hear a, the story of what it means to uh, Ron, Ron, Ron Carlos, excuse me, and Jacob Butler. I keep wanting to switch those last names. Sorry about that. Um, Ron and uh, Jacob are from the Salt River Pima Maricopa Indian community, and they're going to give you um, background on uh, how they came to be potters, how they make pottery, what it means to them. These gentlemen will be sharing a lot of their heritage and their knowledge uh, with you tonight. Uh, archaeologists can learn from uh, uh, this kind of presentation, uh, and it's a it's a incredible to have a, a back and forth opportunity like this. You'll get a chance to ask questions when we get a little farther on in the, in the uh, evening. So without further ado, I'm going to let uh, these gentlemen take the evening away. So thank you so much. Oh, thank you. Good evening. I am Jacob Butler. I am Uncle Kermato. I'd like to say uh, good evening. My name is Jacob Butler. I'm from Salt River. Um, I'm Uncle Kermato, or most people know us as the Pimas. But what we call ourselves is the Uncle Kermato, or the river people. And we're relatives of the Tonawato, or the desert people. And together we we make up the four southern tribes of, of Autumn and living in Arizona between the Salt River Pima Maricopa Indian community, Ogchin, Gila River, and the Don Autumn Nation. So we're all the same people. It's just when people met us, they, they asked us certain names and we didn't understand what they were saying. So that's how the Pima got our name is when the first people came to talk to us, they, they said, what's your name? And not understanding, then they, we, we replied something in, in the way of uh, something much or I don't understand you. And so ever since then we've been known the, as the I don't know people, <laughs> or the Pimas. Mm -hmm. But uh, our name for, for the Autumn is the Autumn and it means the people. Um, in Salt River we're a community of two tribes, the Autumn and the Pipash, or the Pima and the Maricopa. And myself, I'm, I'm Autumn, but Ron Carlos is Autumn and Pipash, or Pima and Maricopa. Um, and today we're here to talk about some of the the pottery that we do, and some of the, some of the reasons why. Um, when, we, when we do this, a lot of people ask us where our will is or how, how we formed our vessels. And the way that we form our vessels is known as the paddle and anvil technique. And Ron's going to be making some here while we're, while we're talking. But um, most Drawings or interpretations of the paddle and anvil technique shows a lump of clay being smashed between a paddle and an anvil. And, and this is my paddle and this is my anvil. And you find something like this just in the ground exactly like that. But an anvil can also be a large stone. And so for, for smaller work like this, I, I prefer something smaller. But if I was making a large olla or a shoulder pot or something like that, I'd use a larger stone. Uh, Ron, I think you prefers to use your hand, right? I For, do. I just use my hand. So uh, when Ron makes his vessels, his anvil is his hand, or his hand becomes his anvil. But when you see this depicted in most um, exhibits or, or most drawings and books, you see the pot that you're working on with the anvil on the inside and the paddle on the outside. And so a lot of people believe that that's the only tools that we use to, to create these vessels. But in reality, we actually use a, a number of different stones. And so if you think of, of these stones as different grits of a, a sandpaper, then that's how we kind of use these stones. So once we get our basic shape created, we'll go over them and we'll smooth out any kind of lumps or imperfections with the stone. Um, and if you ever worked with concrete and you have all the aggregate in there, when you, when you run over that, that concrete and you're smoothing it out, that pushes all those rocks into the vessel. And so that's kind of how this works. And a lot of people refer to these as polishing stones. And, and for the most part, these aren't polishing stones. These are working stones. And 
these stones come in all these different shapes and sizes and they're, they're perfect for, for getting in a, a lip here or smoothing out a curve. But a polishing stone is a little smoother. And it could come in all different shapes and sizes. For the smaller stones, uh, it kind of hurts your hand because your hands uh, at a kind of kind of close together, and it gives you a kind of a cramp after a while. So it's better to find a larger stone. But what you're looking for is a smooth, non-porous surface, something that that's very slick, and that'll give you a a polish like this. And so a lot of people will ask, well, what did you spray it with, or what did you glaze it with? This is just the clay that's been compressed, and then it brings it to that shine. And for me, I like the red on buff kind of uh, style of pottery. The, the red on buff is similar to this, where you have a red design over a buff a vessel. And for me, I think it's very striking. And, and for us, we are the descendants of the Hohokam, or what we like to say they are Hohokam, our ancestors. And every point of, in the Hohokam timeline can be marked by the pottery types that they, that they created during those times. And so for me, I, I like doing this style because it, it kind of ties me to our past and continues a cultural heritage that, that spans over 2,000 years. Um, and that is very labor intensive and I, I, I'm still learning to have the patience to be able to do something like that. Um, and pottery does, it does a, a lot to you know, teach you that patience. Uh, I sit at home and I do this all, all, all the time. I think it keeps us out of trouble, keeps me out of trouble, keeps me at home with my kids. My kids learn how to do all this stuff, um, especially the processing part. And so what you're seeing right now is the fun part. This is the part that we work probably about a month to get to. And then we get to finally make something out of it. But what you're seeing here reflects about a month's worth of work, a month's going out, harvesting the clay from the mountains, processing it with these stones here. So this is a, a pestle for, for a mortar and pestle. And we grind all of our clay down, we take out all the stones, we take out all the, the organic matter. Um, we do we do actually make our, our clay a little different. Ron likes to sift his and take out all, this, all the, the, the bigger rocks and the twigs and, and all the organic matter. And then the temper that's in the, the clay already is the temper that he uses. And so he knows that the clay that he gets is already tempered enough where he doesn't have to add his own clay, or his own temper to the clay. And so the pots that he makes, he knows they're not gonna crack. Um, but if you ask Ron where he gets his clay, he'll say, oh, it's somewhere over that way. <laughs> and he'll point all around this room. I will say, it's all over the place. <laughs> <laughs> and so, the clay that we use is, is, is um, if, you're, if you're serious about making pots and if you're serious about doing this, then you find your sites and you identify your own clay sites and those are the sites that you go to. Um, and and it, it seems to be that way. You know, for, for the most part, wherever I've gone, a lot of people have family sites where they've gone to and their grandparents have gone to. Um, and so that's kind of how, how it is. And for me, I'm not as worried about the temper in the clay as the colors, because you can get a very rich red clay and then you can get a brown clay right next to that, depending on the iron that's in that clay. You can get a very vibrant red or you can get a, a more orange. Like even some of these, these um, red on buffs here that are, that are on, the, on the table, that's more of an orange on a buff. And so for me, I, I look for the, the clay that I wanna paint with. And what I paint with is a very dark red. And so this is a pure clay. This, and the way I get this clay is a little different. I wash my clay, or I think it's called le levigate, or levigate your clay, but I, I wash it. And what I do is I wash it and I, I mix up all that water until it's a very thick, almost like a chocolate milk consistency, and I'll pour that off. And all that water that's, um, that's colored red 
will become the clay eventually. And so I'll keep washing my rocks until my rocks are, are clean and there's no color coming off of them. And then I discard all of that. And then what I'm left with is a few buckets full of clay rich water. And in there, has a lot of organic matter and that organic matter floats to the surface and then you skim that off. And as you let it sit, the, the heavier clays will settle to the bottom and then you can pour off the water. And so that process takes a long time. It's, it's less labor intensive than um, pounding it up with the mortar and a pestle and it takes a lot longer, but what you, what you get in the end is a pure clay. And it's the same process that we use and even around does it on a smaller scale to, to make our paint. But I'm not able to make a pot out of that clay. And so when I'm done, I have to add temper to my clay. And temper could be anything from crushed granite to um, recycled clay um, vessels, even shells from the, um, the ocean were used to crush down and, and used as temper. And the temper allows the, the pots to hold together when they, when they dry, the clay wants to shrink. And if it's a pure clay, it's gonna shrink and it's gonna crack. And when it is exposed to heat, it's gonna to wanna to expand and blow up. And so if you ever look at cement when it's cracked, you see all that aggregate in there. Well, all, that, all that rock holds that cement together. And it's the same thing that the temper does to our, our pots. And so without temper, without the temper, your pots are more ornamental and they're not really functional. And so for me, and one of the reasons why I do this is a pot was first and only created for its purpose, to hold water, to cook in, to store things in. And so I like to bring mine down and then add my own temper. And one of the tempers that I really enjoy using is a micaceous schist. It's a micaceous schist, and I'm not sure if it'll carry over in here, but I'll try it. But it's the same stuff that you use, I guess that would be used to make a blush for, and I don't know if you can see, but my hands might be sparkling. Um, and in the sunlight, it really does sparkle. And it holds your pot together, but it also adds that other layer of character to the, to the pot. And you hold it in the sun and it just sparkles. And it, it, to me, it, it's really cool. And I like to say that that's the only reason I, I use it. But for me, I'm not a, as skilled a potter as Ron. Ron can pop these pots out and if it cracks, then he can make another one. And, um, My pots don't crack. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> if it cracks. Or, but for me, I want to know that the reason it cracked is because I didn't do it right, not because of the composition of my clay. And so I bring it all the way down to pure forms and I introduce them all together to the proper ratios. And then I, I work with those clays. And if you want, I'll actually pass around one of these. This is, a, this is white clay with a micaceous temper in it. And you're able to, to actually touch and feel it. You can mold it in your hand. But that clay is no different other than the fact that it has temper in it to this clay. And this is a pure clay that I'll be using for paint. So when I have a red vessel, I'll pound this down and add it to water and I'll paint with this. The same thing with the red pots. I'll paint with this and I'll make a pot with this. And the only difference is that there's temper in it. And the reason I brought that, that red bundle out is um, we work for our cultural resource department in Salt River. And one of the jobs that we do is uh, cultural sensitivity training. And we talk to people that are doing any kind of earth moving. And some of the people that we've been fortunate to talk to are some of the, the construction workers that were doing the first um, excavations of the, of the Holcomb canals when they were turning them to CAP, CAP canals. And some of these, these older gentlemen told us that when they were excavating some of these canals, they were bringing up these, these clay bundles like this, and they were, there were still fingerprints from the person that had used it last. And it's just amazing to me. Um, and so every time I kind of see these things, I always think of that story that a gentleman told me. And, um, and to, to be able to hold something that, that somebody else touched and left it there and, and no one else touched it since then. 
is like a direct link to that, that time frame. And the same thing with these vessels. A lot of times, um, if you look in here, I mean, I'm not sure if you can see it, but if you look in here, you can see all the worked parts. Because on the outside, we, we smooth and polish it. And on the outside, we, we really make it look good. But within, you have the impression of your anvil. And so you have these marks in here. And for a more open part, uh, 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 open vessel like this part here, older potters would probably tell me that I didn't do a very good job because I didn't finish my pot. So because it's so open, you would want to clean this out. But for me, I get a real kick out of being able to hold a, a pot shirt or an older vessel and, and actually feel a fingerprint that someone else had put in there about 1,500 years ago or 2,000 years ago. I mean, it's special. And uh, I think it's awesome that my kids can fill these pots and they can put their fingers right alongside where their dad put their fingers and, um, and know that, that that was made by somebody's hand. And so I, I leave them in there intentionally, but um, those are usually the pots that I keep for myself and that I use. And so this is my mold. And um, like he just started, he actually took his pot off of his mold already, but what you start with is almost like a, did you make, did you use mold? Yeah. yeah, that's his mold there. So what you start with is a, is a preformed vessel. And you start with like almost like a hamburger patty or a tortilla f size of clay. And then you get that and you just draw it down. And it's very different than other places. Um, there's something that's, that's indicative of the southwestern pottery of Arizona. So like uh, the Autumn and the human tribes, the pie tribes, a lot of the, those type of tribes do paddle and anvil. Or most other tribes like um, the Puebloan tribes and, the, and a lot of other tribes around the country, they do a coil method where they'll roll a long coil out and they'll, they'll, they'll make their pot with that coil. And then their pot will be in the shape of whatever vessel shape that they wanted to make. And it doesn't have to be as thin or as thick as they want. Because once they're done, then they'll scrape and smooth. And then they can start taking down that vessel to the desired thickness. But the way that we do it here, when it comes off of your, your mold, that's about how thick it's gonna be. There's no going back. And then when you're raising it up, you add a little bit more clay to the top to finish your pot. And I, I think you like to use smaller sections, right? So you, you do, he works in a little bit smaller sections and he goes up. Um, for bigger pots, I like to use a larger coil and then push it on the inside and actually use a larger anvil and then start to shape that. And I try to use as little coils as, as I can because one solid piece of clay to me is stronger than a whole bunch of connected coils because then you have more, more chances for it to crack. And so I try to use as little coils as possible. And, uh, I usually get my pots to come up to about right here and then I try to finish it off with a larger coil and then another coil for the, the rim. But it's very different than, than other communities make their pots. And I thought it was something that was distinct to just the Southwest, but um, I recently had the, the, the privilege to go to the Smithsonian NMI Museum and look at their archives and look at some of their collections. And I learned a lot through there, but as I was looking through the exhibits, I seen a vessel that had a little diorama next to it and it had some drawings and the drawings were a paddle and anvil and it was from Nicaragua and I guess in Nicaragua and some of those areas they actually do paddle and anvil pottery as well and so it was very striking it was it was the pottery was very similar to ours as well and it was it was very intriguing because I had never heard of anybody else making pots like this and it's always something that's foreign to everybody else and so I thought it was amazing but um This paddle and this anvil can change. You can use, like, like this one was given to me by an older potter and it, it's actually the back of a chair. <laughs> and so um, it was one of the first paddles I, I got and, and I'm just really comfortable with it. And it was actually much longer and I cut it down and, and now it's like my go-to paddle. I have other paddles, but I always seem to use this one. And the same with a lot of these rocks. I have a bunch of different rocks. I'm always looking at the river when I go. Um, but I always seem to use the same ones. And I think it's the same for Ron. He has a whole bunch of um, rocks that he shows and 
uses for the classes that we give, but I think he only uses the his own. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I don't think he really shares the the the, the ones that he, he really likes. In in regards to that, I was always taught that you're supposed to have your own whatever you're doing. Like singing, sometimes when people sing, they want to borrow rattles. Like, no, it's my rattle. It's for, it's me. It's meant for me. You know, if you're going to sing, you have to have your own rattle. Same with pottery. You're supposed to have your own um, material and tools because it's part of you. You know what I mean? And it's even though they may our paddles may look similar, they're not the same. And he can use it on occasion, but it's not meant for him. It's meant for me. You know. And I don't mean to sound selfish, but that's the way I was taught. <laughs> <laughs> and it's the same, even if you're like, even if like, um, this is knife here, and he gets all bug at the, he gets mad if you ask him if he can use his knife. But I have my own knife, and we have our own things, and um, and it is, it's meant for you, and it, it goes along with, the, I guess, our human there, because even the tools that we use when we butcher, we're gonna use them for that purpose, and we don't use them for everyday use. Um, when we play a game called Gins, I have my own stones and I have my own game pieces. Um, and other people aren't supposed to share those things. And so we encourage people to come out and, and find their own stuff, make their own paddles. And this one was given to me and when it was given to me, uh, it, it became my own and um, I have a hard time letting anybody use it too. <laughs> and then the same thing with these stones. These stones are, are my, my favorite polishing stones here, and I, I use them on occasion. But like I said, I like the buff style. It's a, I like to put my, my creativity into the design, and, and that polishing is, 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 uh, is beautiful on its own, and so I, uh, I very rarely do it. But one of the questions I guess that was posed to us is, uh, well, how long have we been doing it? And so I've been doing it for about 10 years. One of the first classes that we had in the cultural resource department was with the group of um, the Pai Pai tribe. Was it the Pai Pai? Yeah. And uh, they're from the Baja area. And they came out and we walked around the community. I drove them all over the place. They're a group of uh, women that were in their 80s. And um, we drove them all over the community. We looked for clay and then we ground clay with them. And we all made our vessels. And I had done this as a child, but I didn't take anything seriously then. You know, it was just something to do for our recreation education programs in the community, something to do over the summer. And, um, and it wasn't something that you did like all the time. It was something that, like an elder would come in and show you something on a day. And it would be one day out of a summer that you would do these things. And so um, when it came back, it was really cool because I remembered some of the ways that we had done it. And I remembered that, and it helped me. And then uh, working with Ron, we actually hosted other potters, some from the Levine area, um, some of the Maricopa potters. We've actually went out to the Thon Autumn Nation, and we met with some of the potters out there, some that have since passed away. And um, we got to learn from all these different potters. and then. I took all that home and I did this all the time. I got my kids involved in it and, and I just, it truly has kept me out of trouble and at home with my kids and it's something that we can share together, you know. And, and I think for Ron, I think he started uh, 20 years ago. Yeah, I think I've been 19, uh, come October, it'll be 20 years that I've been making pottery. But even then, I didn't, um, I learned only because I, had, I learned from Phyllis Cerna and her daughter Ava's opinion. They taught me, but I wasn't like really interested. I mean, I did it because she urged me to do it, because she would say, you're real artistic. You should learn to make pottery. Nobody's making pottery. And at that time, there was probably only like maybe about maybe eight, seven, eight women that were making pottery. So I learned, but I didn't learn to keep it going. I just learned just to learn because she asked me to. And then as she got older and she started, her health started failing, she would see me and she'd say, are you making pottery yet? I'm like, no. And she said, you need to make pots. Nobody's making them anymore. And eventually I started doing it and it became a full-time thing for me. So it was because of her that I make pottery all the time. 
and there really isn't anybody except me, him, and maybe one other boy. We have a tribal enrollment of 10,000 people in our own community, and we're the only three. There, is, there isn't anybody else. So it's, it's going out of style, or it's gone out of style, and it is a dying art. And I always tell people, especially my, the people in my classes, I'm planning on dying someday, so, so you know, <laughs> it's true, you know, people say, oh, you're just being morbid, you know, but no, I do plan on dying someday, and someone's going to have to keep it going, you know, I'm not going to be here forever, so, something I will say. <laughs> but, and, oh, but, 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 yeah. well, and um, with that, we do teach classes, like, Ron actually teaches classes, I just have the privilege of actually going and sitting down and um, assisting when he needs it, and, uh, for me, I get to use those times to paint pots and work on my own vessels. And if anybody has any suggestions or, or questions or needs some suggestions, then I'm there too. But um, it's amazing how, I guess, um, integrated we kind of are to this modern luxuries of life and um, the easy access to all these conveniences that we do have. You know, even when we teach the class, the students are expected to do everything that, that, that we do, from pounding the clay to processing it out. And when they get there, they're kind of shocked because what they want to do is make the pot. And they want to do the fun stuff. But you can't get to there without taking those, state, those steps. You can't, you can't start that journey halfway on. And you won't know what you're doing. And so the first day is just pounding clay, and you get dusty, and you, you, you know it's, it's a lot of work. Um, that's why I can tell people I didn't have these shoulders until I started working on pots. Right. <laughs> <laughs> no, but uh, uh, he always had that stomach. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I did too. But um, <laughs> but it's a lot of work, and a lot of times, the second day, half of the people don't come back because they don't want to do it anymore. Mm -hmm. um, and then by the time you're firing, even some of the people that that took the time to make a pot don't come back. And um, I say that there are, there are a lot of people in the community that have taken the classes and the, that maybe have taught, been taught by other people that do know how to make pots. And a lot of people say, well, you should only make pots for your own family. You should only make pots, you know, because it's part of your hymn dog, because that's who we are as a people. And, and to some degree, that's okay. But before cash was the, was the society that, 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 that drove society, trade was, was a big thing. And so before we sold our pots, we traded our vessels for the needs that we needed, you know, our commodities. So if you were a potter, then you got food from, from the guy that grew food. You know, if you needed something, then you traded your wares. Everybody took care of everybody through trade and commerce. And so now that we're a cash-based society, we're trading for cash to pay my bills. You know, and, and the only other way that, the only way you become very good at something is by doing it repetitively. You know, if you do it once or twice, yeah, you, you can make a pot and it might look like this one. <laughs> you know, not too bad, but not very good either. You know, and, um, but if you want to make something that you can be proud of, that can go on an exhibit or that can, um, that can really represent you and the skills that you've learned over time, you, you have to do it a few thousand times, you know. And I always think I just started and, and it's funny because if you get away from this, and for me, I work in all different types of mediums, and so I work with um, clay, I work with shells, I, I sculpt, I do all kinds of different things, paint. But when you get away from this, you, you almost have to relearn it. And so it's funny because your hands start falling into that muscle memory and you start to remember it more in your hands than in your mind. And then you just start to get with it. And so like, um, I work in circles. And so I might work on this for months and then I'll stop, and then I'll come back to it sometime around the same time next year. And then I have to kind of get used to that, that feel of the clay, the way it works with, with my, when I paddle it and the way it shapes and the way it wants to move and the way it wants to form. And then after a while, you just, you, you get it. But it seems like every time, every year, it gets easier and easier and easier because you've done it so many times. And I don't think I've done it very many. And then when I look at these books, there's, hundreds if not thousands of pots in there and they all look different and I try to pride myself on making new designs and making um, 
new patterns. And we use traditional designs, but we use them in uh, contemporary expressions of our own. And so um, a lot of the stuff that I do when, when I paint bronze pots or when I paint my own pots are expressions of water because we're the river people. We're the Alcatraz We have water running through our community still. And it's something that most other tribes don't. And it's something that, um, that I'm very grateful for. And I, I, I try to express that on a lot of the, the, the imagery that I, that I place on my vessels. Um, and uh, if you look at those books, uh, they're, they're, it's shocking to me that there's so many different types of vessels in there. And they're all different. Um, but they say, you know, if you reach one person, then you've done your job as a teacher. And I think Ron's reached more than one person. I think there's a lot of people that, that might not realize that um, they're keeping this tradition alive now. But I think later on, as they get a little older in life, um, those qualities and those skills that, that were taught to them by Ron um, will express themselves, and they'll, they'll try to keep this going. And there are actually people that, that are learning now. Like you said, there's one other boy that, that does it. Um, and he does it um, on, a, on a larger scale rather than just doing it for his home or personal use. He does it and he actually sells his work. And so he's making more work and so then he's getting better. There's another um, young man that paints a lot of Ron's pots and he's actually a basket maker and um, he does a few other things. And he's getting better because he's working more and he's expressing himself more on this clay and in this art form. And, um, and that, that's the only way you can grow in something is by doing it and continuing to do it. Uh, now for me, uh, I think I would be in a lot more trouble. Uh, I used to be a little, like a little honorary kid. I used to get in trouble all the time. And um, I think I came into this right when I was maturing. I, I had two, two children at the time and they were both young. And, um, I was very impatient. I like to still go out and have a good time, and and then find myself when I'm working on these these vessels. It, it takes a great deal of your time, and it makes you want to be there to, to do it. And then your kids are sitting there watching you, and they want to be part of it. And so it keeps you at home and it keeps you around. And one of the reasons I do it is, well, the main reason I do it isn't for money. Like uh, I said, I could sell some pots, and then I have enough money to take a. Uh, well, if we have a standing kind of bet that whoever sells more at our shows, we'll have to take the other person out to eat for kind of, kind of helps you feel better. You know, you sell anything, but you're going to get a free meal today. So, um, so when I sell a lot or more than Ron, then I'll take him out to eat. And if I didn't sell anything, I know I'm going to get a free meal at the end of the day. But, um, but, and then it, it it affords me the privilege to be able to take my kids on vacation here and there, you know, but it's truly a labor of love because the amount of work that you put into these vessels, you don't see coming back in, in the form of cash. Um, but what it, for me, what, it, what I do see is my daughters can go to a lot of these national monuments, they can go to collections and they can ask for their father's work and they can see some of the vessels that I left you know, as a legacy to my children. And I, I think it's awesome, not only my children, but our community, you know, and um, I have an artist profile at the Smithsonian now, you know, I have artist profile, people have my, 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 my mark, Ron's mark, at a bunch of the different museums here in the, in the valley. Um, we're actually privileged enough to, to be um, asked to create the first all clay mural at Casa Grande Ruins. And it was amazing. We, we took clay from our community and we put it into an insert in the, the new visitor orientation room and we plastered that whole wall up and we did one side to reflect the whole gum or the whole gum and their art style, their artistic um, style. And we even were able to get a scale replica drawing of the maze that, that's in the Casa Grande ruins and we sketched it out on, the, on that wall. And so it's a big mural. And then all those clays, they're all, they're all modern, I mean, not modern, they're all traditional clays and, and pigments. There's nothing modern on that wall. And, um, and then even the black that's in there is mesquite uh, sap. And then on the alternate wall, we did the autumn section and it 
shows the continuation of that culture. We use the same design elements and we just changed a little bit. But I like to say this too, when people are talking about the Holcomb and the Otham and why you guys are different and why you have different names. But I don't think anybody in this room can say that they live the same way that their great grandparents lived or their great grandparents. And as time goes and anything that's alive is bound to change. You know, and, and as cultures go, our, our culture changes too. And um, so we are the same people. We are the descendants of those great people that created all of these canal systems out here that left this legacy on the land that we're now a part of. Uh, and to me, that's a, a great honor to be able to, to say I'm that little link in that, that chain, you know, and hopefully somebody else will come along and add their link to, my, to mine and continue that chain. And, um, you know, I've, I've been taught by a lot of other people. I, don't, I, I can't say that one person taught me. But I, I think um, in December we, we did our eighth, was it our eighth? Mm -hmm. um, arts market at Pueblo Grand, and we've been urged and pushed to go to other markets, and we both have jobs at the Cultural Resource Department. And, and for me, most people in my community know me as a garden guy. Uh, I get paid to play in the dirt, and. On my days off, I play in some other kind of dirt, you know. And, um, but I, I call Ron my teacher because not, not because he sat and taught me how to do these things, but because I sat with him and I watched him do all these things. And when I did my stuff and I had questions, he was right there to answer them. And so, um, yeah, I was taught by a lot of other people, but. I actually have learned a lot from Ron, and I think Ron has a lot to offer. Uh, anybody that's willing to take his classes, and I, I'm glad he, take, he does them. And I think the community values it, and I think later on when, um, well, even that, later on when, when Ron's gone, or I don't want to do this anymore, or uh, Ron doesn't want to do this anymore, at least they'll have those people out there that they'll have that knowledge and that, that ability to keep it going. And so, yeah, that's, that's why I do what I do. And I don't know if Ron wants to talk about why he does what he does, but. Um. I think we're supposed to stop and let you ask us questions. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. So if you do. If I you do don't. have a microphone here. If, uh, I'll bring it up for, here we go. You can ask us anything. You haven't uh, mentioned how you're firing the stuff. Do you uh, you pit firing or? Electric kiln or gas kiln, or what are you doing? Well, we, um, we fire right on the ground. Um, traditionally, I was told that you would get a lot of your broken pots and you would stack that over your vessels to protect them from cloud marks or smoke, uh, smoke clouds. But uh, as Ron likes to brag and I kind of follow suit, we don't break very many pots. And so <laughs> we don't have that resource to utilize. Mm -hmm. But uh, I think uh, for for a hundred, if not a couple hundred years, metal has been available to the people. You know, um, a friend of mine says, you know, if they would have had it, then they would have used it. And so I think a lot of times people, when they think of like Native American um, made wares, they think of less than or something that was roughed out. Uh, but I think when tin came into play, we used a tin bucket. And I've seen pictures that go back 100 years and a little bit older that show a tin bucket being used as a kiln. And so that's what we use today. We use a, a tin bucket and that takes the place of our old pots. Um, and then what we're, we're trying to do too is for us, like this vessel right here, I think it's really cool. But it's also flawed. And I would kind of really have a hard time selling this because this isn't what I made it to look like. So this is Ron's pot and then I painted it, but when we fired it, it got all these, this fire cloud right on it. And it, come to, it came out really cool, but it's not what I intended it to look like. I don't think it's what he intended it to look like. It was um, a pretty mistake. That's yeah, what it <laughs> but it's a mistake. And so what we're trying to do now is keep those cloud rings off of it, keep it as clean as possible. And so, well, we put in the fire, we wanted to come out looking the same way. A question on the mica schist. I, I know that's used as a decorative 
thing. I didn't realize they'd use it as uh, temper also. Yeah. So when you, you use the mica shit, you don't put any other uh, temper in there? No, and actually one of the pots that I, that I have made with the micaceous schist is um, used by our museum to cook beans in for demonstrations. So it, it's very functional. But um, if it can add another degree of um, character to the vessel, then why not? You know, and, um, one of the things too, a lot of, I know in, I think it's Superior, the pottery that comes from Superior, they believe that the, they use the real chunky schist to keep the pot stronger because there's, um, the clay would stick to it better. But I found that even, even at this level, uh, if I turn it, let's see, if I turn it, it should scale off in sections. Yeah, so right at the end, you start seeing these sections fall off. And when I get the rock, it's these big chunks of stone. And they're, they're laying like that, like, um, like layers of strata, I guess. But it doesn't matter how fine you grind it, it still has that same kind of composition where it lays on top of each other. So the whole reason why it works in big, chunky form, it does it the same way, just on, a, I guess, on a microscopic level, when it's fine. And actually, the vessels that, that, um, that have the micaceous schist in it uh, that's very fine is very, very dense. It's a very dense clay and it's heavy. Even though it's thin, it's, it's a heavier clay because that temper is in there at a much finer grain. Um, Jacob, when you uh, make a pot, you design, you put it, make a design for it and, and incorporate your ideas. Okay, when Ron makes a pot and you paint it, no. Is it his ideas that you put onto it or yours? No, they're mine. Okay. So Ron's ideas are the shape and the form of that vessel. So Ron's the one that created those ducks. He created the form of, of this vessel here or, or this pot here. He'll usually give it to me and say, make it whatever you want to do it. And sometimes I'll say, well, I think it would look really cool if it looked like this. And I'll... Most of the time, I say, yeah, probably not. Um, <laughs> I've even said, I don't, know, I don't know about that part. Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, and it's just hard for me to do that. Like, uh, and, and that's one of the reasons uh, people ask me, well, can I, can I, um, what is that called when you, um, well, they want to, they want me to make a pot for them a certain way. Yeah, yeah can I commission a, a vessel from you? And, um, and I've tried to do it in the past. And someone can say everything they want. I want a red on buff pot with butterflies on it and river designs. And I want the river designs up here and down here. And then I'll give them that vessel that they're looking for. And then when I see their face and their face isn't filled with joy and excitement and it's more like disappointment and that's not what I was looking for, then it's, um, it's very hard to take as I guess as an artist, you know, and, uh, because in your mind, you're envisioning something that you know you wanted. And then in my mind, it's totally different. You know, I think differently. Uh, I'm a different person. And so my expression of that same image is going to come out a lot different. And so for me, I, I prefer to put work out. And if people like it, then they like it. You know, and if they don't, then they'll stay with me for a little longer. But um, it's very hard for me to, to do commission work because of that. Because everybody has their own understanding of what something should look like. And, uh, and yeah, so, yeah, I have, like, I think volumes and volumes of different um, images that I pull from, but I never, I, I find it really hard to, to just flat out copy a design and put it on a, on a vessel. And even if I really think a, a, a design's good and I like it, I won't put it on the same shape vessel. And I'll even try to like change that up a little bit to make it my own, because I think I would kind of get upset if somebody copied my design and put it on one of their pots, and you know that's plagiarism. And I think plagiarism, whether it spans a thousand years or two years, is still the same. You know, I think we should all come up with our own our own images and express our own self through our work, and that's kind of what I try to do. And I think it's really cool to work with Ron. Because he makes a lot thinner pots than I do. And, <laughs> and uh, it, it's really cool to just focus on the painting. I do make my own pots and I, I make my own vessels. Um, well, when we first started, 
I think the whole reason we, we started working together on POTS was because it, it let us get a cheaper booth at a table. <laughs> Because if you had collaborative work, then you didn't have to you didn't have to pay as much. So um, I think that's how it started, and then uh, I think it's really been a good partnership to to work together, um, especially now. Because I don't, I mean, if it wasn't for Ron telling me, I probably wouldn't be here today. I don't make any of the plans. I don't plan for anything. Uh, between Ron and my wife, I I think they get upset with me all the time because they say, "Well, are you ready for this?" Or, well, what are you talking about? <laughs> no, no, um, I told you. <laughs> yeah. And, uh, but I make sure we get here. And so I'm the ride and he's the planner and it works out really good, you know, and when we sell together, we, we sell together. And so, um, but it's also cool to, to know if you're having trouble with something and you're having trouble with um, some part of your work or even just if you want to fire your work together or you want to work together, there's somebody else that does that same work and you can go and share that time because it's always, better doing it with somebody else than just sitting by yourself and nobody really takes interest, you know. Yes, ma'am? I have two kind of different areas I want to ask questions. One is your micaceous pottery. Um, I know in northern New Mexico, both Hispanic people and some of the people around Taos use mm -hmm. micaceous pottery for bean pots. But they, I've been told that the mica is in the clay. It's yeah. not. So it's a different type of thing. Oh yeah, it's totally different. So like, if you look at um, like the, I think Peekeries and Pewaukee, they use yeah. that, that micaceous clay too. Um, and theirs has an overall sheen to it. So if you just turn it, the whole vessel will kind of shine. Yes. Um, where this is more fragmented. And so the, the, the ratio isn't as, as, um, as great. And so you see hints of that glitter here and there. Oh. And so, um, and it's because I incorporated it into it. It's not ground into the clay together. Um, and actually, I did a, uh, I did like a science project with my daughter to find out what kind of ratios go well. And uh, she's in fourth grade, and and I read her paperwork, and I read it all the way to the T. But what I forgot, I guess I I didn't read was that we're only supposed to pick one aspect of that test, and we did all of them. So <laughs> when uh, when everybody else had their, their little foam boards out, they had like one foam board and they had their project. And my daughter had, I think, three or four foam boards and all these pots and all these different stars that she had mixed different tempers. And so it was really cool for her and it was really cool for me because it helped me with the ratios when I'm doing my work. And so uh, it was something that we both kind of gained a lot from. Um, but yeah, it's, it's, it's totally different. The, the, the clay still, just like this one, the clay still retains its overall buff kind of look, but it has a little sparkle to it. And the same thing with the red clay, like this is tempered red clay. And what's really cool is the clay, the, 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 the uh, micaceous stone that I get, some of it's silver, and then some of it has like a rose kind of color to it, some of it's copper, and then um, some of it has a gold look to it. And so I, I like to reserve all the silver stuff for the white clay that I use because I think it's a good contrast. And then the, the rose and the gold I use for the, the red. What's the largest pot you've ever made? Uh, I just got done making one. Uh, and for the most part, uh, I think the shows that we were doing, for me, drove the sizes that I was making. And so I think the largest part for a long time was something like this. Mm -hmm. Because the show that we do is more of a, uh, tourism show and um, large pots don't sell and they're very hard to travel with and they're very hard to, to transport to the show and then it sits there all day and then you have to bring it home and um, I live in a very small house with six six other uh, we'll fly five other people in there and uh, things break <laughs> so I, I don't really I haven't focused on these larger pots and uh, just recently I made a very large pot what was it probably like about two feet, the one that I, yeah, it was about two feet wide by uh, about two feet tall. Um, and then me, because I was so proud of making it, I went and took it out to the show and showed it off before it was ready, dried, and it dried too fast in the in the wind and it cracked. Um, and I got, I actually fixed it, but the amount of clay that went into it and the amount of time that it took to process that clay, I didn't want a chance 
having it crack. And so I took it home and I rehydrated it, did it all over, and I actually made a pretty nice shoulder part about this big and about this wide, and it still hasn't been fainted yet, so it's at my house right now. But that's probably the largest um, for me. I think the largest one I made was probably, I don't know, it was, it was pretty, I made six of them. They're big water oils that um, our community relations department asked me to make for them. So I made six of them. Now I don't know what they did with it, so. <laughs> probably sitting in somebody's house somewhere. <laughs> but I haven't done it in a long time. For the same reason, you know, it's a lot of material. It's a lot of wood, because we use wood. And I'm the only one who cuts wood, so. <laughs> so it's a lot of work. And I don't, I don't really like doing it. It's too much. It is too much work, and they're hard to transport from one place to another. This is one pot. It's you know, it's not that big, but it's still a job to take it from one spot to the next. So I mainly stick to the small stuff, but I, I will make whatever if someone orders it. But and then <laughs> I think there's different skills too involved yeah. in it, like. A, if you're focused on making these smaller pots, when you move to, to make a bigger one, it, there's some degree of, um, there's a curve that you have to, I guess, kind of get past because the weights are different. So um, gravity is going to sink your pot, so your bottom's got to be supported a little different. And, uh, uh, and other tribes that use a puki or, or a bowl or some type of support underneath it. And I didn't think that we used things like that. And then uh, we were a Pueblo Grand. And there's actually evidence on a shoulder pot there that it looked like it was sitting in another bowl. And then I started looking at older pictures. Um, and although there weren't pukis in the, the, the sense that we know them today, a lot of the pots were made outside and they're made on the ground. And then when you see the blankets laid out that the pot's resting on, they're resting on a mound. That, so the, that dirt's built up around it to, to actually make form like a, a, an earthen puki, I guess, like a, an earthen mold that supports that, that bottom. And so um, so I went out and I found me a nice rounded out puki and I, I use it and it works very well for these larger pots because those pots weigh a few pounds, you know, and, and wet clay is just going to, gravity is just going to drag it down. And um, that helps keep that contour on the bottom. Oh. Uh, first of all, I want to say I've been through the contractor course out there, and it was wonderful. Oh yeah, yeah. And I always think it's funny you have all these contractor guys that are showing up, going, "Oh God, I got to go through this for a day." And yeah. by the end of the by the end of the session, it's very very entertaining, very educational, and I think they walk away with a different appreciation. So I just want to thank you for that. In your understanding of, of the historical, has this always been somewhat intimate of a process with the clay, or has there, in your understanding, been a production line at all ever um, um, utilized, maybe back when it was more of a commodity? I think, uh, I think the tradition was passed down more within families, and then now it's more in like uh, communal settings, like through classes and stuff like that. Um, and I think there was more regard for the art and so people held it in a higher regard, and, and, and historically it was, a, it was a primary source of income for a lot of people, and so that's how they, that's how they survived. And so it was, I would say the production line that you talk of would be more in the processing of all the materials. I think it's very much a family affair, and I, I think it continues to be. Uh, that's why I say at my house we have a big sweatshop sometimes. We all get in there, and, and my kids are working, and, and um, I think if, if it wasn't for my kids supporting me and my, my wife, uh, it would take me much longer to process a lot of this stuff out. And, um, but that's how people learn as well. You start off doing the stuff that you don't like doing, and then, um, then you know that process. But I don't know if Ron, Ron could probably talk to you about more about it too. Yeah, I, I think that in regards to the processing, it's more of a communal thing because when I, the old time potters, when I was growing up, they all had their own little areas, but they all seemed to work together. They collected, you know, uh, their families would collect and they seemed to all sit together. And I, that's the way I do, My, the, our family, all the clay that I'm using, I didn't, I didn't process it. The, my family members did it for me because I don't have the time to sit and do it. I have a job, so they're home, so they, they do all the work for me, the processing. But I know that's how I saw it growing up. Majority of the potters, their relatives, were the ones who did the actual processing of all the clay. And there, I know of some of the old folks that sat together and made pots 
you know, individually, they all were selling their own pottery, but they would make pottery together. And uh, I think it kind of inspired each other to do different styles of work, uh, be more artistic, you know, because um, a lot of the pottery that's meant for use is just like this, just, you know, just plain. There's no design, it's just basic shapes. Whereas, you know, I know that uh, when they sat together, they got more artsy and made, would make ducks and stuff like that, you know, and it became more of a, I see what they're doing, I see how they've done it, I'm going to do the same thing, you know, kind of learn from each other by sitting there. You know, that's why I see it. You've mentioned that the uh, pottery making is a dying art, and there are three of you that are doing it. Are you um, hopeful that some of the people that are taking your classes are going to actually grab hold of this and take off with it and become potters? And is this more um, prevalent in either one of the communities, the Otham versus the Peeposh? Well, in the classes, I mean, there's always people who are naturals, you know, I can see it in them. But it's I'm hopeful that in the turn, in farther down the line, they will keep it going. And what I do a lot of times is I have the classes, but then I also have, or was having what I would call the pottery gathering. And all my students who took my previous classes could come. And it was, but I would specifically pick out those that I felt were naturals at it and better in abilities to try to get them to keep doing it, you know, to keep making pottery because I felt they were worthy or that their skills were uh, much better than most people. Because there are some people who can pick up clay and they can just make anything real quick where others will struggle and they'll struggle to try to make something. And so I try to encourage all of them regardless, but I try to make sure those ones that I feel that have the, the ability to do it, to keep coming back and to keep learning. And I always tell them the same thing. The more you stick with me and the longer you stay with me, you'll learn everything that you need to know. You'll know exactly where the clay's at, you know exactly what kind of rocks to pick up, everything, even down to the wood, what kind of wood to get. I, I try to tell them, stay with me, you know. The more you do it, the more you learn, and the more you, you learn, you'll, you'll learn all my trade secrets, I guess you want to say, you know. Because I do have my secrets. Man, yeah. <laughs> but, but I try to encourage everybody, regardless of their style of work, you know, and, um, but it, it really comes down to personal endeavor, you know, because a lot of people, and I always tell this to people, because sometimes they want me to do things with the, like, um, alcohol rehabilitation type stuff. And I always tell people, if you have a life that's hectic, that you're running from one spot to the next all the time, you'll never make good pottery because you don't think about it. You have to think about it as you're working. You have to think about what you're going to make while you're making it. And if your life is just, oh, I'm going over there, I'm going over here, you, you, you can't do it. And, and those type of people in my classes are the ones that always seem to drop out because their life is getting in the way. The pottery is not, it's not in their mind, it's not in their heart, it's just something they're doing, you know. It's, it's not part of them yet, so. Does that answer your question? I don't know. <laughs> I can't see, so I don't know. I don't know who's talking to me. <laughs> Sorry. I'm curious about the lighter uh, vessels that you have, especially the one with the white top on it that wasn't perfect. Where Did do I, you get the clay for those? These? Oh, this one? Yeah, that one and then oh, yeah. all those light ones on the right side there. Sometimes, uh, you know, there's different veins in the mountains. They're not all the same. I mean, a lot of people think that if you dig from the same spot, you're going to get all the exact same color, and that's not the way it works. It's usually in stratus, you know, and so sometimes you hit veins of pure white. I mean, just pure white. They're usually really thin, but occasionally get it. Same with the red. Sometimes, you, like, he gets really good red where he gets his clay from. He's stingy with that information, too, so, <laughs> <laughs> you know, you don't know. <laughs> so, let me see that one again. Mine. That one. Okay. Okay. So, like, this... This is the color I'm using, and, and I like this color, but only I'm, I'm the only one digging from that spot. But in that same spot, there's, like he was saying, there's layers, you know, there, sometimes there's more brown even underneath, or more red. It's just, it's just finding that clean, good vein that you have to, you know, go through, and it, it's hard to, hard to separate them sometimes. You see a certain, uh, just a darker layer or a brighter layer, you want to get that, but you're trying to get rid of everything else. And there's nothing wrong with the others, just it's not the right color you want, you know. But 
that's about that's the answer I can give. And then um, for a while, um, I was trading clays with these people from Levine, but I didn't like their clay. It, it was too sandy, <laughs> and it wasn't it wasn't white or this buff color. It was more of a gray color. I didn't I didn't like the way it looked, so I stopped trading with them. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Um, I know in the past, a lot of families in a bunch of different tribes, the craft skills go down the family line. Are either of you from families that made a lot of pottery? I'm not. Um, I'm not either. No. And uh, uh, my mom and my dad are both artistic, but uh, they follow different paths in life. Uh, I've always been encouraged to, to use my talents and so uh, this is just one way of expressing those um, but no uh, ne neither of my parents or my grandparents made pottery um, and for some reason it just I just took to it I personally don't come from that either but but um, my family I, I will say we're real Indian I mean my grandparents are real hardcore believers they weren't christians they were they were stuck in the old ways you know and um and a lot of the people i guess would say they were like respected in that way because people always came to my grandparents for advice they always came to my grandparents to hear songs all, all kinds of stuff whatever it was indian ways they they, they did it and that was in regards same with the pottery even though my grandparents didn't make, make, make pottery a lot of the old folks would come to my grandparents, and, and my grandparents had a truck, so they would always ask them, can you take this out, you know, and my grandparents never refused. They took them out there to get clay, so even though I didn't make pottery, I always knew where the clay was at just by being part of the family, you know, and going with them and helping. And in those days, you did as you told, you know, you don't do what you want to do. You do as your grandparents tell you, you know, they, they say, cut wood for them. You go and cut wood, you know, you don't ask questions. They say, dig clay for them. They want that clay right there, dig it. You dig it, you don't, you don't argue about it, you know, you just do it. So in that sense, you know, I seen it and I would, you know, they would sit and they would come and talk to my grandmother all the time, the old ladies that make pottery. And I always just seen them do it, but I never tried to learn myself, you know. I just, not until I got older, and now that's all I do, you know. <laughs> Ron, it's been fascinating to watch you uh, put that vessel together up, up there. Could you just highlight some of the steps you went through, and uh, do you have to finish it in the next five minutes, or, or <laughs> what, what's next? Yeah, it's finished. <laughs> no, it, I'm okay. I, I started out with the tortilla, like he was telling you. And I put put it on the, the base of another pot. And in, in Maricopa, you know, I'm Pima and Maricopa, but culturally and linguistically, I follow Maricopa way. I can talk Pima, but I, I really follow Maricopa tradition way. And so in Maricopa, the different things have names, whereas in Pima, they don't really have names for all the different things. Uh, a pot made specifically for making pottery for a mold is called Nyem Tam whereas pottery itself is called gel. You know, there's a different name for the different types of pottery, water, water pots and all that. But you, you make your tortilla and you put it on the base and you, you make the base of this new pot. And as you're going and you coil up, you use your paddle to shape. And um, I put my coil on it. You, you can, hopefully you shouldn't be able to see the coil marks, but there is coils on there. And you just, you know, use your fingers to thin and use the paddle to shape the way you want it to go. So Normally I go higher, but I'm not showing off. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just kidding. So Let's what go. Happens, what happens next then? Now it's it's well, after it, while, while it's drying, a lot of times like the, um, like how he adds the schist into his clay, I, I don't do that. My, sh my clay already has a lot of rocks in there, a lot of sand, and so I don't uh, put anything in there. So as it dries, the clay starts to shrink and the, the grit starts to come out. So as it's drying, when it gets to a leather hard, you take a, a semi-smooth stone, uh, let's see, like, like this one, this is, and you rub the stone real quick, you know, to take off that grit, either to push it back in or to rub it off altogether. That way the pots don't have a rough texture. It, unless you don't care, you can leave it like that, but I don't like that texture. I want it to be semi-smooth, so. 
But once it's dry, like to this point, then you, if you're going to do a polish, then that's when you, you take your really, I don't put out my good stones because they have a habit of walking away, but, <laughs> you know, a stone similar to this and you, you know, rub it and that, that's how you get this polish on there. But we don't really do polished pottery much because it, it takes too long and we just have too many events and we just don't have enough time to do that. I think this pot right here probably took me, I don't know, it took me probably about almost a week to, dec to just to polish the pot. But I don't do that as much. I, I usually just leave a mat. But I don't know if everybody knows this or not, but I'm, I'm going blind, so I can't see out of my left eye anymore. So my pottery is getting heavier. If you look at pots like these, these are broken pots that we've had for like probably like 10 years or however long, 12 years, a couple of years, but they're a lot thinner. And so the pots I'm making now are a lot heavier than they used to be. So. It's just, and he has a full-time job now, yeah, so it's so, a little easier. But that's where Jacob <laughs> comes in. He, that's what he draws from the majority of the pots. I do draw on my own pottery still. It just takes me like, probably like two months to draw in one pot, so I don't do it very much. So he, it's where he comes in. <laughs> well, I got a question. Yes. Um, how do you go about deciding what design to use? Do you plan it out real carefully in advance, or do you just sit down and kind of start making stuff up? How, how, do, you, how do you choose your designs? Well, with myself, that's how I do. I, I used to draw it out and, and think out my pattern before, but be, now I don't do that. I just, my last several pots that I decorated, I just put random marks in there and then I just filled it in and it came out okay, so. <laughs> <laughs> Nobody argue, argued about it, so. <laughs> and uh, I don't know about Jacob, he, he has his own way of doing things, so he, he, he can answer you that. The, the, when I started a pot, like, uh, let me see that one. This one? Yeah. This isn't real clean, but. Um, Nothing overlaps. And so if you look at it, from, I, like, I like looking at it apart from the side, but when you look at it from the top, it's a totally different image. And, um, and so that's how I kind of come into my designs is, is I look at it from the top and I, wanted, I want all the points to meet up. And I follow a few principles uh, in design that I, that, that I have for myself. And um, a lot of the, like the, the whole come right on buff stuff where they do like the four panels. I like to try to follow that four panel kind of look or um, where in that four panels, the alternating images parallel each other and then these parallel the, 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 the opposite one. And um, I like to do a lot of that. But in mine, I like to take it further and instead of using like a, a, a four sections or a four panel image, I, I try to do like eight panels. And if you turn it, in eight different positions, it'll be the same. And, um, and so when I start out, I lay out my grid. Uh, in my head, I already say, all right, well, I'm gonna do it like this. And I have an, uh, a primary design that I, that I know I'm gonna put on. And, um, but even getting to that, I have to sit there and look at this pot for a minute and see what would look best on it. Um, and then I lay out that design. And then once I get those points kind of lined out, everything else just comes as it goes. As it goes on the pot, I just start filling in um, sections. And when I work, a lot of times you'll see overlap on people's pottery, where, or you'll see an, a, a section that's got a gap in it and then they'll put something in there that's totally different than everything else on the pot. And I think it's because it wasn't measured out right. And it's just kind of like, um, it's, it's, it's a flaw, but it also, flaws are, are part of life. They're, they're, for me, it's really hard. I try to make everything as perfect as possible. And even when I started, I would get things and just throw them away, like almost halfway done. Um, because I went to school for a while for commercial arts. And in that field, you're, you're trying to have everything perfect. And so I, it took a lot for me to, to kind of understand that you're going to have some flaws in your work. and and that's just part of life. Um, but the design elements that I lay into them are all based on um, Altham or Hulgum designs and it's just the way that I'm putting them in are a little different. But yeah, that's how I get like a, 
that's how my lines or my line work comes out really clean is I, I I make sure that all that stuff's laid out first and then when I put it on line like like for instance this line here this line here was repeated every time until I got to the end so if I were to mess up on any one of those 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 marks I can fix it before everything else was filled in and so if I'm only working on this section here and it looks really clean and tight when I get over here and there might not be enough room or it wasn't measured out right there's no going back I can't change it it still has to either look like this side or it's gonna be flawed and so by doing one stroke at a time on everything that I do then I know that it's all gonna come out symmetrical and all, all in order and if it doesn't then I'll be able to have the I guess the leeway to kind of mess around with it and fix it um, and change it into another design and so a lot of people think that we draw them out or we have this pre-planned idea of what it's going to look like but I, I like to do a lot of these um, vessels at shows and there's nothing marked on my pot and I'll sit there and I'll paint them all out and a lot of times like the last part I did I had like 40 hours worth of work in it mm -hmm. and um, and that one was all done by hand without any kind of pre-sketching or understanding of what it was going to look like going in and I think by not having that understanding of what it's going to look like going in it it frees that vessel out to becoming something original and all of its own because um, I'm not following a, a form that I've done a hundred times before. Well, I think you had a question that you'd like to ask. I'm not sure if... <laughs> well, actually, you're talking a lot about what I wanted to ask about. When I look at vessels like that with those kinds of designs, I think, mean, how in the world do you start out knowing that you're going to have room to make it symmetrical as you go no. around, particularly when they start yeah. Steps and that small vessel, there's four pounds, I think, in that one. Could, could you repeat that question for, for the rest of the audience? Just um, it was just how, how, do I, how do I keep it symmetrical and how do I keep the, the, the lines all the same as I go around the vessel, especially when you have curvature to your pot. And, um, and like on these ones, you have these different elements that are stacking on top of each other. Um, this one I didn't do. This is one of um, Ron's um, students that did this one. It's very well, um, very very well executed. Um, and I'm not sure how he does his. Uh, it's really cool. <laughs> 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 uh, but it's really cool. Yeah. But, but, but even like drawing. I mean, like when I school, we I would learn to draw. My teacher used to use yucca strips, and and I we used to do it that way. But it took too long because the yucca doesn't absorb enough paint. You can only do just little tiny sections at a time. And so I switched to a regular brush, and I think that's pretty much what we all use as a regular commercial brush, you know, to paint with. Because it takes a long time when you use that yucca yucca strip. And I think that that those natural brushes work better with organic pigments. So like with the mesquite, it's very hard to draw with a paintbrush yeah. because it wants to run. And that yucca kind of holds it in. And so when you, you paint with it, then it holds it in. But um, to keep it symmetrical, like see, like this part is, is very well made. And I, and I really respect the guy that does it. But for me, there's, there's not a lot of um, overlapping patterns on it. And so it's easy to point out all the, I guess, the, the, the flaws or the, um, how do I say, the, the, the non-uniformity of the line work. And so in my work, too, I have a lot of that. I have a lot of flaws in there. But especially the stuff that I'm making now, I've learned that when you look at an image, you don't look at an individual line on that image. You look at the overall image. And so for me, I like to put a lot of overlapping design works, uh, like design elements on a pot. And so like I said, I start with, with one single design and it looks very, very um, basic. Kind of like that pot I painted there, like that now would be the, the start of a design. And so like this would be maybe my first layout. And then I'd come in here and put in another design and then I'd put in another design. And every time you add another layer to that, it starts to trick your eye. So you don't see all the little wavy lines or the little paint 
um, that was put that, that spilled on the vessel, all that stuff starts to to kind of blend together, and it, it tricks your eye into seeing one solid image instead of seeing all the mess ups. And and for me, even and the parts that are here now, I can see everything that I messed up on, but I'm the one that made it, and I. And I do that a lot of my shows is uh, people will be really into the work on me. Like, yeah, but I messed up right here and I messed up over here. And it's really hard for me to, 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 to just let it be. But, um, but I think that like for me, is as long as I have that baseline drawn well, and then I put in a lot of elements within the interior of that design, then it tricks your eye into thinking that it's a lot cleaner than it actually is. Ron and Jacob, thank you so much for sharing your knowledge, your craft, and uh, being even the, the little defects that you <laughs> worked into the system there. Thank you so much. Oh, thank you. Thank you.